The big brain members of our two-wheeled community might have plenty to disagree on, but no matter where your allegiances lie, most of us can agree on one thing. Everything is really weird these days. We've got toddlers vaping, autonomous EVs committing vehicular manslaughter, and neither candidate in the presidential primary can remember what they had for breakfast. And unfortunately, motorcycles don't seem to be exempt from the bizarre influence of our seemingly paradoxical culture. Bikes are getting bigger but going slower. International manufacturing partnerships are creating homogenous bikes rife with brand ambiguity, and online squids are being prosecuted for their highly documented documented criminal activity. As it turns out, the filmed in Mexico disclaimer is not legally binding. And also, it seems like no face, no case doesn't really work. We're gonna talk about all this and more in today's episode of Boomer Rant Dude yelling into my phone camera in the cab of my pickup truck, Dude Yammy Noob. Let's get into it. We're gonna start off strong and get right into poking fun at electric motorcycles. Electric vehicles in general are not a solution to our looming ecological problems. They are a marketing exercise designed to get nerds excited about paying more and getting less. When it comes to an electric motorcycle, the idea is even more backwards. Gas-powered motorcycles are already a far more sustainable form of transportation than practically any other vehicle. Why do you think you see so many scooters in Asia, Brazil, India, Europe? Europe, everywhere. And when you think about all the production costs associated with making EV batteries, the amount of time it would take to see a return on environmental cost would take longer than the lifespan of the vehicle itself. The same can be said about whatever fuel savings you would see on a $20,000 electric bike. If you were really concerned about cost and sustainability, you would get a 250cc dual sport for a couple of grand and get 70 miles per gallon. So instead of pontificating on the who, what, when, where, and why of electric bikes, I'm just going to list every single reason why electric bikes are dumb. One, one, they're for nerds. Two, they're built by nerds. Three, they're incredibly expensive. Four, EV charging infrastructure ranges from okay to non-existent depending on where you live. Five, range anxiety. Six, lack of dealer network. Seven, the inability to service them yourself. Eight, the lack of parts availability. Nine, question of reliability. 10, uncertainty that electric motorcycles are anything more than a fad. 11, they don't have a clutch. 12, they don't have gears. 13, they're heavy. 14, they don't make an exhaust sound. Where's my broom? broom. 15. They don't have a catalytic converter that you can cut off and sell to the scrapyard for crack. 16. They don't have any oil that can leak on your garage floor. 17. The faster they go, the shorter the range. 18. The computer systems don't have optimal antivirus software or are susceptible to e-worms. Listen, I don't buy into the whole EV thing, especially when it comes to motorcycles. I'm sick of the fetidization of electric bikes and the feigned enthusiasm journalists have for them. In 1975, Stanley Meyer created a dune buggy that ran on water water instead of gasoline. He was then poisoned during a dinner with Belgian investors, so I think we can all learn a lesson here about alternatively powered vehicles. I've been doing bike giveaways for over five years now. I've given away 50 motorcycles valued at over half a million dollars. I know, it's kind of shocking to me too because there is no corporate mindset here at Yami Noob. We're not controlled by some big company. It's literally just me and a couple of guys who really love motorcycling. So if you want to support the show and join thousands of people who make this all possible, hit that link on yamminoob.co and become a member today. Your entries will get you access to win these exclusive giveaway motorcycles, the Discord server, behind the scenes content, and live streams with yours truly, Papa Yam. So if you wanna hang out with me and a bunch of other crazy degenerate motorcycle enthusiasts, head over to yamminoob.co and become a member today. Another trend that we can blame the Eco Karens and the Euro 5 Emissions Committee on is the stroked out beginner bikes that aren't really much better than the ones they're replacing. Case point the Ninja 500. The first glaring problem is it is not a 500. It is a 451cc engine. That is a whole 49ccs that they fudged hoping nobody would notice. Secondly, it makes less horsepower than the 400 it's replacing. The Ninja 400 makes a claimed 44.8 horsepower. The new Ninja 500 makes a claimed 44.7. By lengthening the stroke, they've achieved a marginal increase in torque, but decreased the red line peak horsepower and added on about 10 pounds of weight. So the question is, why? 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 
And how long will this pattern continue? Will Kawasaki keep squeezing out a few foot-pounds of torque and ultimately end up with a Ninja 600 that has a 551cc engine but still makes 45 horsepower? I understand manufacturers are limited by Euro 5 standards and A2 compliance, but a heavier bike with a bigger engine that makes the same amount of power makes very little sense. Wouldn't the idea be to make a smaller and lighter bike with 45 horsepower, but then they likely wouldn't comply with current emissions restrictions? The whole thing is just kind of paradoxical when you think about it, it is really hard to be new and improved year after year when there's so many limitations in place. Speaking of paradoxical, we need to talk about the sport bike Ouroboros that is currently eating itself alive. With emissions regulations and a waning popularity in sport bikes, motorcycle manufacturers collectively agreed that it was better to invest in torquey parallel twin naked bikes that have a power delivery more suited for street duty as opposed to racing. Fine, that's okay. Whatever, you're a bunch of sissies and you don't want to go spend money on a leader bike. I get it. As most people will agree, the experience of riding a high revving four cylinder sport bike is tailored for use on a racetrack. Peak top end power, committed ergonomics, and stiff suspension all ultimately proved to be inconvenient on most public roadways. This is not news. We all started getting bikes like the MT-07 and then the Honda Hornet 750 and the Jixxis 8S followed suit. These bikes have playful twin engines and comfortable ergos that make them pretty well suited for city riding. But then Aprilia made the RS660, which has proven to be an optimal balance of linear usable power and sporty, but not too sporty ergonomics and handling. So then Yamaha, after discontinuing continuing the R6 for street use, released the R7, a fully fared R-Line sport bike based on the MT-07. And now Suzuki's released the GSX 8R, fully fared sport bike based on the 8R, which is going to be raced alongside the R7 and the RS660s in the Moto America Twins Cup. So Suzuki doesn't make a new motorcycle for 20 years, and then they make a middleweight naked bike designed to alleviate the inconveniences of a sport bike, and then turn that same middleweight bike into a sport bike without all the characteristics that make a sport bike a real sport bike. The GSX 8R is like a French bulldog, bred down to satisfy the superficial aesthetic requirements of pompous dog owners, and since then lost all of its practical canine characteristics. Can it hunt? Can it herd? No, but it requires a $5,000 surgery if breathing becomes fatal. I understand everything is cyclical, trends, the economy, politics, but with how rapid things shift thanks to technology, the internet, the general access to information, we're seeing like three generations worth of trends change in just five years. Bikes used to go unchanged for decades, and now we're getting these reverse engineered sport bikes because people decided they missed fully fared motorcycles after a few seasons. And look how stumpy the tail is on this Jixxis 8R our race bike. It looks stupid. Don't even get me started on the Daytona 660. It is also frustrating how limited many manufacturers' offerings are for the American market. Yeah, we have lots of privileges as American riders. You can take the MSF course in a weekend, get your oil baron father to buy you an R1 as a birthday gift, and you can smear yourself across the pavement once you toggle over into sport mode, which actually, you won't be able to do that very soon because the R1 was discontinued. RIP. But we just don't want lethal sport bikes here. I mean, we definitely want them. Please, Biden, if you're listening to this, do not take away our lethal sport bikes. Oh, he's asleep. He didn't hear me. Please. Although there are quite a few more diverse offerings in other countries, for instance, in Europe, Yamaha sells four varying trim models of the Tenere 700, including Extreme, Explore, Rally, and Raid, as well as the Tracer 7 and Tracer 7 GT. They've also got the XSR 900 GP. Look at this thing. It looks incredible, which expands on the XSR 900 platform to build a a quirky little retro racer. Han has other options overseas as well, like the NT1100, a sport touring outfit built on the parallel twin engine from the Africa Twin. Even the Hornet 750 hasn't come stateside yet, although the Trans Alp has. I think in Europe, motorcycling is far more common as a practical means of transportation, whereas in America, for most, it's a luxury good where motorcycling is seen as a hobby and bikes are expensive toys. So I think as a result, because we have a more educated but specialized customer base, we get offered a lot less options. In Europe, the customer base is a lot more broad and requires more diverse offerings to accommodate. At least that's my speculation, but I'm just a dog in an armchair. That just means in order to start seeing some of these exclusive European offerings, we need to get more Americans 
guns on motorcycles. And since we're on the topic of complex multinational business, it is worth mentioning that I am getting pretty darn tired of these international manufacturing partnerships, which essentially boil down to motorcycle company private labeling cheap bikes made in India or China. I recognize there is so much behind these deals that few plebeian commoners can understand, but there are definitely compromises that come with outsourcing of manufacturing in this way. That's not to say that there is always a compromise in reliability or build quality per se, but a compromise in the character feel and novelty. So much of what attracts a rider to a specific brand of motorcycle are the ethereal qualities that come from its origin. A certain motorcycle is a window in time and place it was built and designed. For instance, the Yamaha VMAX was built in the 1980s by Japanese designers in a California office and designed to cater to American muscle car enthusiasts. And as a result of this really unique amalgamation of people, places, and ideas, it is a special, timeless, genuine motorcycle really unlike anything else. We of course know the CF Moto, KTM, Bajaj, Menage Atoile, but there are countless other instances where these mass-produced bikes with global appeal losing their X factor. For instance, Honda makes the CB350 in India where it is sold locally and exported to Southeast Asia. This bike is quite literally a Royal Enfield Bullet 350 or Harley-Davidson's Chinese bikes that are built by QJ and expected to come to the US. Or how many Chinese-built bikes using Ninja 650 clones engines do we need? It's like the broader the scope of these brands and the amount of places where they're designed, built, and sold increases, the less special and exciting they feel. It's also frustrating to see the amount of bikes that are made and sold with no other goal than having a slightly lower price tag. Like if I were in a middleweight adventure bike market, I wouldn't buy a Motor Marini X-Cape. Not because it's made in China, but because it uses a Ninja 650 engine. I would happily pay double the price to get a motorcycle that offered something special, something unique. And you don't even need to pay twice as much to get that. There's countless other bikes that are a tad bit more expensive than the X-Cape that offers so much. These bikes are exclusively catering to people trying to spend as little money as possible, and that is annoying to me. I like a good value-driven motorcycle as much as the next guy, but the global industry push to undercut major manufacturers to try to eke out a handful of uninformed buyers probably needs to stop. Similarly, stop resurrecting defunct motorcycles cycle companies. No one cares about Norton. No one. And if the off chance someone does, they're 90 years old and aren't about to drop 20 grand on an off-brand Triumph Thruxton. Triumph doesn't even make the Thruxton anymore. And Benelli? And again, Moto Marini? I'm sorry, but I don't think anyone really cares. Buying a motorcycle that was built in China and bears the name of a defunct Italian company is not any better than just buying a Chinese motorcycle. The Italian motorcycle niche is strange. These are the bikes that are really expensive, really cool, really bespoke, but might explode at a moment's notice. Or there are the quote unquote Italian bikes that are made in China and super cheap to buy, use really generic parts, and might also explode at a moment's notice. I think a lot of these brands are just way behind in the retro fetish scene, like they saw Triumph rise from the ashes to become the neo-retro goat, and then Indian managed to find success as well, so now Norton, Motomarini, Benelli, and frankly even Buell are all trying to find similar success, albeit going about it in different ways. Buell and Norton are leaning into the bespoke, hand-built, highly specialized premium buyer market, and Benelli and Motomarini are just slapping their nostalgic logos on whatever bikes Zongnen or QJ tell them to. We just want good, exciting bikes from companies with relevancy and cachet. We don't really Really want or need any of these brand reboots. Sorry. Okay, guys, my boomer rant is over now. Thanks for bearing with me. I feel a sense of peace and calm now. I can't be that off base, though, can I? What do you guys think about the current trends in motorcycling? Will things get better? Will they get worse? Will the government implants in our brains explode if we don't get an EV by 2030? For more outrageous hot takes, become a member at yamminoob.co and enjoy exclusive content and awesome community on Discord, automatic entries to win our giveaway motorcycles, and much more. Thanks again for watching be sure to subscribe if you like what we do here and i'll catch you guys later fact the modern orange carrot was developed in the netherlands in the 17th century before that carrots were mostly purple or white goodbye keep watching yammy nerd